welcome into Be The Eve. I'm Sierra Sanagati. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Be The Eve. Um, we are so thrilled to have you all in here in the space this evening um, as we celebrate Fibroids Awareness Month and have real stories from real women who have experienced fibroids and are now fibroid free um, and have been patients here at Be The Eve. If you're not familiar who we are, we are an integrated women's healthcare practice specializing in OBGYN, fibroids, and soon to be some other services, so stay tuned for those, because they will continue to build out how we support women's health uh, throughout all phases of her life. Um, without further ado, I will pass it over to our moderator this evening, who is a creative producer, content creator, mother, women's health advocate, I would say, the multi-hyphenate. And that's great here. Yes, and the one that. Enjoy the conversation this evening, and um, we will open it up to conversation at the end. So have your questions ready. Enjoy. Thank you. I 
who were last year, how, how did I end up with fibroids? And my mom didn't have them. I didn't know anyone who had them. So for me, it was just strange that I ended up with them. Come to find out, my sister doesn't only have fibroids, she had innumerable fibroids. Like they couldn't even count how many she had. Um, we don't know about the history of our family just because we're living in Africa um, our whole lives. You didn't talk about that stuff. And you know, the women in my family never talked about it. They never looked like they suffered from it. Nobody ever said anything. So I don't know if my grandmother had or didn't have. I know my mom didn't, but me and my sister did. Um, and so of course, naturally, I had to go through my options quickly. Like, okay, so if I have this, what am I gonna do? And uh, I knew for me, and this is a very personal decision, so it's not a judgment on people's decisions, I knew that a surgery was completely out of the question. I was not gonna have a surgery. Um, UFV, uterine fiber embolization, was like, I like that option. We've been doing it for over a year now. We've had great success with it. That's where I wanted to take my chances. Um, and so I thought, what a great way also for me to kind of be the patient, that would be the owner and see what do our patients go through? What do we put them through? What is the recovery like? Is it painful? Is it not? Um, how do we treat our patients and what's the follow-up like? So I kind of did it kind of like a test as well and I went through it. It was phenomenal. Um, the procedure itself took like, I want to say half an hour. I recovered for about two hours in, the, in our facility and then I went home. And then I recovered for five days and I went back to work on the sixth day. Um, so it was a very short recovery period for me. I'm not gonna lie. My recovery period, the first three days, was extremely painful. After the UFE, for me. Now, we have patients who have come to me and said, I didn't have any pain. I was out with my friends the next night. I had patients who said, it was like really bad period cramps, but I'm used to it. And then we had patients who said, it was like labor pain. And I thought, I'm so tough. I'm gonna be the go out the next day with no, I'm, I got this. I did not have it at all. Um, it was very painful the first three days. Um, I did have enough pain medications to kind of like, you know, tame the pain of it. But what I did learn, being the patient, is that it was very confusing. They would say on the paper that we gave patients to take this medication, but then they picked up the generic medication from the pharmacy so the names don't match. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm in a lot of pain and I don't even know which medication I'm supposed to take. So that was one of the things immediately we knew we had to change. Um, so just being honest about how you know, not painful and how painful the recovery can be. I think it was very important for me to, to, when I talked to women after that. And really fixing the things like the medications and not having the same name and it being confusing and things like that I thought was very important. Um, but six day I was back to work and within the next few weeks I started noticing I always looked six months pregnant when I was with fibroids even though I was, <laughs> I did. Even though I was working out all the time and eating really healthy but I always looked like, I was like, uh, that went away completely. Um, the bleeding went away completely. Um, I went back to getting my period every 28 days, and it was even lighter than it was before, so it was even you know better. No period cramps when I got my period. No lower back pain anymore. I had leg pain when I had fibroids. I didn't know it was connected to fibroids, but it was. I couldn't even walk for like more than 10 minutes without having a lot of pain in my legs. That completely went away. And I think because of all that, I ended up losing like 12, 13 pounds, which was fantastic because that's what I needed to lose. I have gained them back during COVID, so this is not like 12, 15 pounds that I lost, that was before. Um, but I've gained them back and some, but that's okay, that's COVID. Um, but it really worked, it, 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 I was so happy with the results, and I was so happy with my life after it. When you feel better, you want to look better. When you want to look better, you go to the gym more, and then everything just falls into place, and then your relationship with your husband becomes better, or your partner, your relationship with your kids becomes better, because you're not always in a bad mood. And so for me, personally, it was life-changing. Um, but I also know women who've had these questions, my mentees, and said that was great for me. It was life changing. And I think that's a really personal decision women have to make for themselves. And that's kind of what we try to do here at EV. We really try to get women to, we try to empower them with all the information they need so that they know exactly what they're going through, exactly what their options are. And then we really try to empower them to make that decision for themselves. No doctor should ever tell you, it's directly, that's what you should do. My mentee, that's what, that should not be someone else's decision. You're the one that has to recover. You're the one that has to make that decision. So we really try to be very good about that here and say, here are your options. What do you think is best for you? And whatever the women choose, we really wholeheartedly support it. There's no judging. We just support it. Um, because you're the ones that are going to be at home with the and living with the decision you made, and that's really important. Um, but that was my journey. And of course, we just we fixed a few things that I realized were not working well. Um, we added a few things that I thought would be nice touches, like small gift bags every time somebody does a procedure with us or, you know, 
things like that. Um, and I've been 543 ever since. I think I did the procedure, I don't know when I did, 2016, 2015 maybe? I think so. So it's been like six, seven years. Um, they never came back. Um, I've never had issues with them again. Um, now all I have to look forward to is menopause, which is great. So <laughs> that's my that's wonderful. But not five ways at least, so yeah. that's that. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, for the Italians <coughs> and those who are online, can you explain the procedure, the yeah. OB procedure? Um, just kind yeah. of even. It's actually really cool. Steps. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really cool. It's, um, we go through the artery, either the artery that's in your wrist, which people are like, how do you get to the fibroids from the wrist? But we go through here, or we go through the artery that's in the groin. And they literally go through with like a, a catheter that looks like a spaghetti. It looks like a really long spaghetti. Um, and they make a tiny, tiny, tiny decision. So when it's healing, it looks like a mosquito bite. It doesn't look like anything more than that. And they go in, if they go in from here, they go with the catheter up and down into your wrist. And they try to find the arteries that are feeding your fibroid blood because the only reason your fibroids are growing and flourishing is because your body now thinks it's pregnant and it's feeding a baby blood. And all this blood is rushing to your uterus. And so the fibroid is feeding off of that and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we find the arteries that kind of give that fibroid blood and we block them with these tiny particles. They look like tiny particles of sand. And they're used in heart procedures as well. They're used for other procedures, so they're very safe. Um, and we block that artery. And so that fibroid is no longer getting a blood supply, and so it can't survive. So it starts to shrink and shrink and shrink, and it becomes completely inactive. And it initially dies, but it becomes really, it just becomes inactive. Um, so the fibroid doesn't necessarily disappear, but you don't need it to. You just need it to be small and inactive, where it's not causing any problems, it's not taking up any space, and that's kind of what the UFE does. Um, that's why the recovery time is so quick, is because you literally have a mosquito bite that you're trying to recover from. Um, we didn't open or cut anything. Um, and your body, everybody's body reacts in different ways. But the reason you get pain during a recovery is because you had all this extra blood flow going to your uterus to feed the fibroids, and now your blood flow went back to normal. But that's a little bit of a shock to your uterus. It went from having this much blood flow to this much again, even though it's supposed to have this much. But that's a shock, and anytime you shock your body, it reacts. So, you know, your body's reacting to that, so there's a little bit of pain or a lot of pain or no pain during the recovery. And then your body gets used to the new blood flow again. It's like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be getting. Okay, we're good. And we don't really affect the blood flow to the rest of the uterus. Everything stays the same. You're just cutting off the extra supply that's going. And so that's how it's done. And so, Rikisha, I see you looking at your mosquito bite. Yeah, I still do. <laughs> so it tell, it. tell us about is it, is it. I can't see it from here. So I'm yeah, sure it's I super really have it. It's so small. It's like unbelievable. Yeah, I can barely super find tiny. it. Yeah, can you I show the folks out here? Yeah.
a little tough for me because I think I'm super strong and I'm like, I felt good the first day. I'm like, oh, I'm not bad. You know, I'm good. Second day, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start reading myself off the painkillers because I don't need the painkillers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I know the pain came back. I was losing my mind. I called and I'm telling you, I'm calling it's 8, 9 o'clock at night. The doctors were on call. They called me back. I spoke to the doctor. No problem. Go back on the medication. I followed the instruction this time. <laughs>
starting to really hurt. And then so after like a few minutes, I start to see redness. And I'm just like, okay, now I know something is not right. Um, and that's when my whole journey of seeing what was going on began. And I just feel like I, I was just going through the most um, in, a, in a way. And that's not to just not like else, you know, drag or anything. But um, I, I, I seen about three or four doctors. The first doctor was like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. This is something that's just going to go away. You know, touchy, touchy, feel, feel. Just um, take these medicines. And um, the, the second doctor, here, take these medicines. You know, it'll, just, it'll be all right. Um, the third doctor, one thought I was pregnant. Um, and I told her, I'm like, uh, you yeah, know, I uh, know I'm not pregnant. She was like, are you sure? I'm just like, I haven't. She should be sure. You know, I'm not even active here. I know that. <laughs> And um, she's like, okay, um, then she thinks it's something that's like a hard tissue or something there. Another doctor even mentioned cancer, and I'm just like, and that was a whole thing. And yeah, I, I went through the worst of it and um, tried to get an MRI done here, but they weren't giving me proper information to get an MRI, so I ended up spending money to travel back uh, down south, uh, Birmingham, which is known for their, you know, one of the hospitals, UAB, uh, to get an MRI, then they had to turn me away because, once again, not getting the proper information on how to get scanned here to see what's going on. And at this point, I am telling them, almost in tears, listen, something is going on inside me, and my, there's no way my stomach is going down. You know, we have these waist trainers and everything, you know, going on now, working out. Um, and they're just like, yeah, you know, um, sorry. Sorry you came down here for nothing. That was just pretty much it. And I had to end up training back around. And um, ended up seeing another doctor. And um, that doctor, she felt around. She was like, we need to get you in an emergency scan. And I'm like, emergency scan? We mean emergency scan. She was like, yeah, there's something going on here. Clearly. <laughs> but what do you mean, emergency scan? Um, and that's when... After that scan, fibroids came into play. And I'm like, okay, at least now I have a name. This is five doctors. Yeah, this is like from the fourth, because, yeah, but if I say, about, yeah, about the fourth doctor later. And um, so I'm like, I'm glad that we at least have a name. So now I'm going into research. I'm on my computers, I'm on my phone. Um, is this treatable? Would this just go away? How many, you know, the statistics? I'm looking up everything. And um, BBE popped up on the search, one of the searches. And this is probably really after about the days. <laughs> Reading up on everything. And I called them. When I tell you I have never met a staff so warm. Like they, they were so warm. And I love how they really gave us so much information. They were very informal. And not only that, I've never heard options. Like, at least you heard my myomectomy. I did not even hear my myomectomy until I got to BBE. And for me to hear about my myomectomy after four doctors later is, is really something. And, um, and, <laughs> no, you 
I wish I was as confident as you to saying that I got this. But, uh, <laughs> 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 you know, yeah, yeah. but it always been thought of beforehand because a lot of things that in my life, I just knew for the, not 100%, for the most part, I get the worst feelings. And I'm just like, I just might as well get ready. And sure enough, that is what happened. So uh, I went through it really, really bad, like my first three, three or four days. Very excruciating for me. I was like, just one of those ones. Hey, I'm back at work. You know, next day. Um, that did not happen. But either way, the procedure was just like this. You know, anesthesia is my best friend. So I just <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right. Wake up. Yeah. 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 Because I was literally out of it, like rolling out the hospital. Like, what is going on? And uh, after that recovery just started getting better and better, I can, I can, like I said, like you said, I would tell anyone to go through you with LP. If you, if you feel like you don't have another option, you feel like you just, you still want to be that person to get up and go, you still want to have kids, you know, just all of your, you know, all of your options out there, you would you have to just get it. And I'm just so happy to run across for them to take me like they did because nobody was there.
cut for you. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, I, I guess I have two questions. One, if I mean maybe it's a little bit personal, but how big were your fibroids when we did the surgery, and how much shrinkage did you see, and how long did it take? And then the other question, maybe more of a generalized. Um, is, it, is there times where the UFE doesn't work? Like if you have too many or too big? Um, sure, those yeah. are great questions. So yeah. let's go down and we'll sure. talk about the size first. Sure. Mine were tiny. Okay. I had two mm -hmm. and they were two centimeters. One was two centimeters, one was two and a half centimeters. Okay. But fibers are like stores they open. Location, location, location. Mm -hmm. It's not about the size, it's about where they are. Mm -hmm. So because one of my fibers was in the cavity of the uterus where a baby's supposed to be, yeah. That's what caused the severe heavy bleeding, the severe cramping, the severe, and then the one in the wall of my uterus was pressing on the nerves, that would cause like the leg pain. And so it's really more about location than size. So mine didn't shrink so much because they were already very small, yeah. but I check on them every year, and in the ultrasound you can see they're completely inactive. One actually got removed because when you have a fibroid in the cavity, when we treat it with UFE, there's a risk that that fibroid detaches from your uterus and falls in the cavity. If it falls in the cavity, it can block the entrance of the uterus that can cause severe infection. So anytime we have a patient that comes to us with any fibroids inside the cavity, we do a follow-up after the UFE, we make sure to remove that fibroid. The ones in the wall you can keep, but mine shows inactivity every year since I've done the, um, the UFE. So that's the size of mine. So for me, I had about four, the size of an orange, I was told, yes. And I done my surgery in 2021. I went back probably three months after the procedure and they have been shrinking. My stomach is not as bloated as it was before. Can you see? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I have no complaints. I could literally lie my back and I could feel them. You could feel it in your, like a fist. I'm not sure if you guys have, but you can feel it. I don't do them anymore. So I know I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> Uh, so for me, I had five. <laughs> uh, three, four, five. Uh, my biggest one was a 16 by 10 centimeters, and yes, that's pretty large. And that was um, uh, subserosal, which uh, subserosal and subducosal, which is one on the outside of the cavity and then one on the inside of the muscles. And I had them in both places. Um, then the next one was um, a five, a four, a three, and a two. And so she's, she's like, girl, you just got to be on the floor. <laughs> um, and so now two, of the, two or three of them are completely dormant. And uh, the other two are not, they're not active. Um, so they have shrunk, but they're not completely like detached or, or gone. But they are, they are, I can feel the difference, you know, immediately. Um, and even after me. With my symptoms, I had I had swelling of the feet and uh, ankles because I was going mine, and then I also felt the nerves in my legs as well. Um, then I had um, I was actually uh, anemic. Yeah, I had actually been diagnosed with anemic once, and um, I had uh, bloating going on. Constipation was a uh, to me, uh, so I had quite a few uh, things going on. But now they are. The smallest one is six centimeters now, so that's actually that's the biggest one. So that's you know, from 16 to, mm -hmm. to six, yes. 16 to about, about six now, and then the other one, the five, that is only about two. Okay. So it's a significant change, and that's in a year. Or so I had my surgery done in April 2019. Okay. okay. So it shrinks over time, and then yeah. it stops shrinking because they're dead and they right. don't, they're not active. Your second question was, is there a situation where UFE doesn't work? Mm -hmm. It's very rare, but like anything you do, there are always exceptions to the rule, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had patients who we treated their fibroids with UFE and new fibroids grew in, in a different place, not the same ones. The same ones will never grow again. Yeah. But that was very rare. It's happened maybe in 1% or, actually I don't want to throw out percentages because I'm not sure, but it's very rare that it happens, but it can happen. Then we treat that with new fibroids and it, it gets resolved. It's still better than cutting yourself open several times to treat right. fibroids that are coming back. Um, fibroid, UFP was actually created many, 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 many years ago when they were trying to find a way to shrink fibroids so they could do a myomectomy safely. So women were coming in with fibroids this big. To do a myomectomy, cut you open and cut up the fibroid, they were sometimes cutting the fibroid and women were bleeding. And so they created UFP, they discovered it so that it could shrink fibroids so they could do the surgery safely. 
But when they created it, they discovered that half the time they didn't even need to do the surgery anymore because the fibers were shrinking so much and they were becoming inactive. So that's how kind of UFE came about. Um, UFE was created for big fibers. A lot of there's a misconception with a lot of women who say, well, mine are too big, I've been told I can't. That's not true. They work on very big fibroids. They work on very small fibroids. My sister had innumerable fibroids. She could, you couldn't count how many she had. She had fibroids and adenomyosis, which is a condition that mimics fibroids a lot. It's, it's very similar, it gets treated the same way. Um, she came after I did mine. She was very encouraged because she's, I didn't know this, but she spent maybe 16 years being told hysterectomy, hysterectomy, hysterectomy. So she stayed away from it. But my memories of my sister, she's two years older than me, my memories of my sister have always been in bed for half the month, missing work, missing school, missing class. I always thought, she's so lazy. Who's just in bed that long? Like, I was young, I was like, who's just in bed that much, right? And she was always like, my period, I'm like, I get my period. I don't stay in bed for 10, 15, 20 days. Like, come on. I didn't know she had fibroids. I only found out maybe five, six, seven years ago that my sister actually had fibroids, and that's what it was all those years. So she came, and she did the UFE procedure us. I've never seen my sister this way. She hardly ever stays in bed anymore. She, when she gets her period, it's like, eh, wait, I think, is that a cramp? I think it's a cramp. <laughs> uh, okay, it's a cramp. Whereas before, she, you know, she had to take shots because her cramps were so bad. So she had innumerable ones, and it's changed her life entirely, completely changed her life. So you can do UFE with a lot of fibroids, big fibroids, small fibroids. Um, the only thing that would make you a candidate is if the fibroid is cancerous, which is very rare, but it does happen, but it's very hard to check for that. Or sometimes the location of the fibroid is very tricky and it wouldn't really benefit from it. We're very honest about that because there are other options. Um, but it's rare. Most people are good candidates. Yeah? Hi. Hi. Um, in the same realm of having innumerable fibroids, because I know I have at least 10, but maybe oh. my MRI just stopped counting. Yeah. It's the number four. Yeah. Too many to count. Exactly. That's something. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> do you know if those first few days after the procedure, if the pain is more because of the size or the amount of fibroids no, that you have? Mine were tiny. And my pain right. Was I've had two that. kids. Yeah. Vaginally, this pain was worse than that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Funny enough, I say that, and if you ask me, would I do the UFE again if I had to in a heartbeat? I wouldn't think twice because it was three days versus a lifetime of discomfort and, and pain and psychological trauma, really. Um, and it was three days of we manage it with pain meds so it does get better. A hot bath really helps. But no, it has nothing to do with the size. We've had women come in with watermelon sized fibroids and they didn't even know they had fibroids, which is shocking to me. They're like, what? I have fibroids? Um, and they've done the procedure and some of them were like, oh, I was out with my friends. And some of them were like, this was really bad. It really depends, I think, on the person. Yeah. Very nice. Um, I'm If you have, so this is a conversation you know, I put it out there and in the Insta world and we're having this event, um, ask questions, share your stories. And there were a couple of people who were like, there is that conversation out there where it's like, just live with them. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that safest procedure, never do a procedure if you don't absolutely have to, right? So we do have women who come and they discover with us that they have fibroids and we ask them, do you have symptoms? They're like, not really. Is it bothering you? No, then leave them. There's no need to touch something that's, they broke, don't fix it. So we do have women who don't have symptoms and don't have any, and we tell them, no need to touch them. Because when you hit menopause, and we will all hit menopause, sooner than all of you, but we will all hit menopause. As you can tell, menopause has been on my mind lately. <laughs> die by themselves when you're done with menopause because the blood supply to your uterus naturally gets less during menopause. So if, if we get women who are in menopause, why don't yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 touch them? You're going to finish menopause in a few years, they'll be gone. So we're very, very mindful of who we recommend. Yeah, you're very honest. Yes. 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 Yeah. One more. No. <laughs> Any questions? Um, if, uh, there's a lot of research online that you know the UIV might prevent you from carrying a baby, like, it's yes. not clear. Yes, um, it's not clear because it's very, it's, it's tricky. So I think the last statistic I read is 1% of women who do the OFE end up not getting pregnant after. 
but they don't know if those women would have gotten pregnant anyway. So there's no, they can't really correlate it to a fee, but they're like, let's be safe and say that we found that 1% of women, or 2% of women, 98% of women who do the UFE go on to have babies. We've had many patients who did the UFE and then got pregnant and delivered with us because we're women's health, we do, we do it all. Um, there is no there is no scientific correlation between the two, but to be safe, they found that 2% didn't or 1% didn't, so they're like, let's just at least let people know. Sure. Somehow that grew into, don't do you if you're not gonna get pregnant. Yeah. It's not true at all. Actually, fibroids will prevent you from having a baby. Fibroids will have will let you have a lot of miscarriages and it will prevent you from actually getting pregnant, having a, a like carrying a tube. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. We partner with, because we know that's a concern for women, we partner with a few really good um, fertility centers. Mm -hmm. And what we do is they'll send us patients who wanna try to get pregnant and have fibroids, we'll treat their fibroids, we'll send them right back, they get pregnant with them. If it was true that it doesn't allow you to get pregnant, a fertility center who makes their money off of getting pregnant would never send us all their patients. And we do the vice versa also. We, we treat fibroids and we send them to them and they get pregnant. So it's such a minuscule percent that it's not even worth considering. But we always tell them, if you're worried, if you're even stressed about it, freeze your eggs, freeze your eggs, do the UFE so that you have that option forever if you choose to. If that makes you more comfortable, we always recommend that. So you do the e UFE before freezing? No, right? you freeze no, you your eggs. Then you do, the, this is women who come and say, look, I know you're telling me there's a very tiny, tiny, tiny chance and there's no correlation, but I'm really worried. You say that don't do the UFE, freeze your eggs first, have that safety net, do the UFE, and then if you can't get pregnant on your own, you always have your eggs that you froze. We recommend that, but we've had so many women get pregnant. But you could also do the UFE before egg freeze. Yeah, yeah, you think, yes, of course. Yeah. We just, it's the women who are worried that the UFE will affect their I ability see. to tell them that Rest your, you know, rest your mind, put your mind at ease, and, and freeze your eggs first. Okay. Yeah. I actually have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too far in a way. Um, one, one, what, is, what is your youngest patient that you've had of fibroids? Quite young. So we we recently had, in the past two years, we did have a patient who came to us who I believe was in her late teens, maybe like maybe 1920, by fibroids. But we've seen fibroids in patients as young as like 17, 16. We haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't treated with UFE because I think if you're that young and you have fibroids, and I could be wrong, so don't hold me on this. I don't know if you have it for long enough for that to be a problem, but I don't think we've treated anyone with UFE that young, but I know that we have read about and seen one or two patients that were really young and had them. But it's not common, it's not common. Okay. Not and uh, my second one will be a follow to that one. Do you think it would be a good idea to Put the information of fibroids in like high school, and the reason why I ask this question is because I went through this where it being in high school and my cycle was just so heavy and so painful, and my PE coach was just like tough it through. Yep. You know, every every woman has cycles. You're no different. Yeah. You know, you're just <laughs> making this. You're just exaggerating this. Like you think it would be a good idea to put it? I don't know. Junior high, high school. Yeah, I think that would be worth looking at statistics how many girls have fibroids at that young age, and if it's anything above like 5%, I think it is worth putting that information out in high schools. If it's such a tiny, like point something percent, it may not be worth it because I don't know enough about how young you can be for fibroids to grow. I just heard of a few like weird cases where the girls were young, but I don't think that's the norm. So I think it would be interesting to see the statistics first and then make a decision based on that. But the one thing I will tell you is I tend to see that all my friends who complained of really heavy periods in high school ended up having fibroids, right? Even though nothing showed up then. Um, and as women, we all know that we are raised to think, oh, it's normal. Oh, you're bleeding really heavy, that's normal. Oh, you're a woman, it's normal. Oh, you have really bad cramps, that's normal. And the one thing my husband taught me when I first met him as an ob he was like, it's not normal. Don't let anyone tell you. It doesn't mean something's terribly wrong, but no, this heavy bleeding, prolonged bleeding, really bad cramps, it's not normal, and it always means you should check it out, because there might be something, either it's adenomyosis, endometriosis, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, you know, fibroids, the list goes on and on for women, so but, but it could be something. So he always taught me, no, it's not normal. We're, we're taught that it's normal as women, but it's not. Calling back those same doctors <laughs> and telling 
telling them that you told me this, yeah. and why to save the next, save for the next woman that's going to go through that. Hopefully, she won't have to go through that. Could maybe they be considerate and think of, and just be honest. If I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer, and does this suggest something else? Have you ever? You know, I did not call back those doctors, and that, that probably would have been a great idea for me to do, but not a great idea for me to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> not for me, because I've been through a lot with that, but um, it did raise the question of why you did not know. Because you would think, I know, or I would think that medical information is spread and you know circulated around the industry so much. Um, everybody is trying to you know, get patients <laughs> and just the last thing I'll say about this is something that I learned very early on when we opened the when we started treating fibroids is, of course, one of the main statistics we learned was black women are affected the most by fibroids, and black women die the most during childbirth, and black women get the most hysterectomies in America. And I used to go to these events we used to do in the beginning at um, the Javits Center, and um, what was it called? Was it the name of the Circle of Sisters. Circle of Sisters. So we used to be a part of the Circle of Sisters every year until COVID, and I remember very quickly catching on that the black women that would come to speak to us were always very suspicious of the information we were giving them. And I thought, of course they are. Of course they are, because they get lied to a lot, they get dismissed a lot in medicine, they get told, why are you asking this? I'm the doctor. They get, you know, oh, you're being dramatic, right? So I was like, of course they are. And so when we built our, our culture, we really, really built it with that in mind of absolutely not. Not a single woman should ever feel like, that's a stupid question. Why are you asking that? You're being dramatic. It can't be that bad. Don't ask on the doctor. And I was like, that's never happened. Because back home, that happens a little bit as well with, with women where I'm from. And I was like, I see it here as well, especially with black women. And that's not fair. No one should ever, their medical journey should never be shameful. It should be empowering and educating. And that's it. And we don't get it right all the time. We don't. We make mistakes. We have patients that sometimes get upset and say, I didn't get the care I thought I, I you know, I thought I was going to get or I deserve. But the difference between us and other places, I think, I think, is when we don't get it right, we care and we fix it. When we don't get it right, we call the patient saying, I'm sorry, what did we do wrong? Because I will learn from that. I don't learn from my great reviews. I, I revel in my great reviews, but I don't learn from them. Um, and so I think that's the main difference. I'm not going to pretend we're perfect. We do get it wrong sometimes, right? Because we're human and we have 100 people working with us. And even though they're lovely and warm and, and, and you know, amazing, they're human and there's human error involved. But when we do make a mistake and somebody is disappointed in the care they receive with us, we care enough to go back and say, wait, stop. What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? And let's apologize. And I think that's what's missing sometimes. And it's that human care of no one should ever have a journey in medicine that's shameful. Really, it's shameful. And so we try to change that. That's all. Okay. Can I ask a question? That is probably the next one. No, no, no. Go ahead. For the men out there that, for a lot of women, this is new, but we're more clueless than, than women when it comes down to this. After the first procedure, we're all hoping, women alike, right, that we don't have this issue anymore, but if we do have this issue and it happens again, what are the chances of the numbers or what, how can we not become discouraged if it doesn't work the first time? So, you know, it's, it, first of all, it's very rare that it doesn't work the first time. It does happen. We have had patients who we've done repeat UFEs on because we consider it like a touch-up. We get most of it the first time, and then for some reason a new one grows, or we didn't block the artery enough, and so you know it doesn't always work out, but that's very rare. But when it happens, I think if you're a woman who's been suffering, and a lot of our women have been suffering for 10 years plus with fibroids and symptoms, and when you've been through it the first time and you see how much it changed you, and then you have to go back in a few years for touch-up, your attitude's a bit different. You're like, yeah, I don't mind. Nice. I don't mind. It wasn't so bad, and it was such a and it changed my life so much that I'll do it again. I think I would get more discouraged if I was cut open and had to stay home for six weeks from my left and then they grew back, which was what happened to, that's why we came up with this. So many women were coming back to us after nine months of a major surgery. You five words everywhere. That's a lot more. So if you're a woman and you've been through that or seen someone go through that, and then you try this, we try to get people not to be discouraged. I can't, I can't help it if they get discouraged, but it's hard to get discouraged because it, it's such a life-changing experience and but it's you not think that bad. Home, you know, it's a little cut, it's a bikini cut, it's a scar. Right. It's 
Like I yeah. said, it's like a, a mosquito bite, like you said, in comparison, and it's less traumatic. Yeah. And think of it this way, when you get Botox, you have to go back for a touch-up, right? Mm -hmm. When you get an facelift <laughs> or enough, after a few years, you have to go back for a touch-up. This is, it's a, it's a well worth touch-up if you have to go back for it, and it's in such a small downtime. So I hope that that's what makes women not get discouraged if they need to come back for one. Thank you all for being here. Everyone walked away. With some new education, yeah. some new information, okay. information to take home to others. That's kind of the goal that I'm in. Um, but if you have any further questions, the ladies are here. And I'm sure the gentlemen here also. Yes. They're definitely gentlemen. I've, I've, I've had a long career. Um, but they're here to answer.